you all for coming. I'm Jamie, for those of you that don't know, the city manager here in Capitola. And I just want to talk a little bit really quickly about why we scheduled this all boards and commissions meeting uh, for boards and commissions. I'm not sure if everyone got the invit invitation. If not, my apology, we will have this material will be available on YouTube so anyone who wants to watch it later can. Um, the reason why we're doing this is because the city council is going to be considering a potential ballot initiative next week on the council's meeting, council's agenda. And as board and commission members, we know that you guys are leaders in the community. People often ask you questions about what's going on with the city. And we thought we could provide a little bit of an overview about kind of what's going on and why the city council may be proposing a ballot initiative coming up this November. So this is the quick overview. Um, for those of you that don't know, we're going to be doing the slides. So if you can see that TV or that TV, um, those are the best places to kind of see. We tried to put a lot of cool graphics in here, so hopefully you'll be able to see them if anyone wants to move. No problem. Um, we were going to talk a little bit about kind of Measure F um, because this measure does involve Measure F and talk about what the commitments were and how the city has kept them. Talk about our financial forecasts and what we're looking at as we look ahead into the future and to talk a little bit about the potential revenue measure that the city council will be considering next week. So first off, Anyone that doesn't remember, Measure F was passed by voters in 2016 with 81% of the vote. It was a 10-year sales tax measure. That was a quarter cent. And it was really, it's a general, it was a general tax, which means the revenue could be used for any city purpose. But the real driving force behind it was the drive to improve the city's oceanfront facing infrastructure, as well as uh, making the wharf more resilient, rebuilding the wharf. Um, <clears throat> Earlier on, we repaired both the flume and the jetty. The jetty sustained more damages in the storms this last winter, last winters. Uh, we have since repaired them. And then obviously with the wharf situation, it ended up turning into an even more complicated project than we initially anticipated, involving both the repair, demolition of the structures, and then the rebuild of the wharf, making it better, stronger, more resilient moving forward. Um, We've received about $6 million worth of Measure F funding since it was implemented. Um, this is where the money went. Uh, the, you can see the big blue bar there is, is the wharf. That's over $3.5 million, which is that's where the money went for Measure F into the wharf. It went into, there was a couple of pre-big prod, pre-resiliency project um, projects. We went in there, I think it was in 20. 19 maybe, and redid some of the pilings at the head of the wharf, some of the steel pilings. We were concerned about them holding up through that winter, and we weren't ready for the larger project yet, but we really wanted to stabilize the head of the wharf. Thankfully, we did. I don't know if the head of the wharf would have held up had we not done that. The other uh, big piece was during COVID, we did use some of the funding to help support the police department during uh, their sort of patrol, their work during that sort of pandemic-related cri fiscal crisis. And then you can see the flume, jetty, and then we purchased uh, the beach loader, which is the loader that you see Public Works crew operating out there on the beach, on the sand, moving the sand around every year and making our beautiful beach. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our Public Works Director, and you're going to talk a little bit about some of these projects that we've done with Measure F. Hello, good evening, everyone. Very nice to see you all here tonight. Um, as Jamie said, a lot of these uh, Measure F funds went to capital projects and capital purchases. Um, one of the very first purchases off of Measure F funds was the beach loader. It replaced an old um, piece of equipment, and that's really critical. We use it every year. We use it throughout the whole summer to really maintain our beach, keep it safe for the junior guards out there and our other visitors and residents to enjoy our beach. We also use it in times where it's a little less pleasant. Um, we've used it a lot during the last couple of storm events to move, move sand and then just move heavy objects away from the beach, away from the village. So that piece of equipment probably gets the most use of all the heavy equipment, plus the street sweeper um, by our public works crew. Next slide, please. Um, as Jamie said, uh, in 2020, 2021, we rebuilt the flume. If you're not aware of what the flume is used for, we have so-called creek that uh, goes out under Stockton Bridge into the ocean right here at Capitola Beach. Uh, in the summertime when the flow is really low, we direct all that water through the flume so we are able to expand our beach. And that was really something that is, uh, until recently when Santa Cruz got their flume, kind of unique to the area of Capitola. So we were able to rebuild that both structurally and to prevent some other uh, sinkhole related issues. And it's been working really lovely for the past uh, four or five seasons. Uh, 
one of the other points I would note about the plume is not only does it let us build our beach every year, but it also is very important for the habitat. Um, the habitat in SoCal, in the lagoon in SoCal Creek, historically the creek would do what it does, what we see it do, where it sort of dams itself up every year, which provides a spawning habitat for a lot of small fish. Uh, if we didn't do this because so much of the old lagoon has been taken up by development, it wouldn't form that sort of natural lagoon which would be, remain connected to the ocean, which would end up bringing in salty water, bringing in kelp, and we wouldn't have that kind of habitat for the fish. So there's both a biological benefit to the flume as well as obviously it lets us have a world-class beach. Along the same lines of maintaining and enhancing our beach, uh, we have our jetty, which also allows us to keep sand on Capitola Beach. Um, had been deteriorating over many years that it's existed. So with Measure F funds, we were able to also, in fiscal year 2021, rebuild the jetty. Um, did sustain a little bit of damage uh, in this past storm season, but with the permits that we acquired for that project, we're able to continually maintain uh, the jetty. And next slide. And then lastly, I think you're all very familiar with the uh, Capitola Wharf Resiliency Project. Like Jamie mentioned, we did do some pre-work on the wharf uh, prior to getting this larger project off of the ground. We've been fortunate to have a lot of other fiscal sponsors for this, but Measure F was really important. It showed how much the community really cared about this facility. Um, it not only uh, funded the project, but also when we had the storms and other items, we were able to have that money up front to go ahead and do all of that repair work. Hello, good evening, everyone. My name is Andy Dow. I'm the Chief of Police for Capitol Police Department. Um, as you are aware, that Capitol Police Department does provide policing services 24 7. Um, this slide, uh, we're here for your community. Um, Measure F funding did uh, help support policing operations during the last uh, several years. Uh, next slide. Um, we also uh, respond to emergencies, and uh, the funding here is very, very important to and vital to the police department to re remain com competitive. It also um, provides the necessary funding to, to, to sustain the police department, to sustain us internally, um, to help with our training, uh, and our community outreach efforts that we do. We, we believe in community policing. Um, we want to... Um, continue with the programs that we have and continue the outreach efforts that we do. Um, and then if we're always willing and, and willing and able to step up when we need to during those emergencies. All right. So looking ahead, I want to talk a little bit about kind of the fiscal picture and sort of what we see coming down the pike, which is really the reason for why we're going to be talking about what we're talking about possible revenue increase. So I'll turn it over to our finance director, Jim Malberg. You can talk about what the challenges you see looking forward. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, so this first slide that I have up there is um, what we do is we look at all of our different revenue sources and all of the different expenses we have by line item. We take a 10-year average, and then we forecast that out to kind of project what our future is going to look like. So um, the numbers I have up there are for the five-year, and then I actually have a graph for 10, but I always say the 10-year gets a lot cloudier than the five-year. But you'll see that basically for the next three years, um, we're fairly balanced. We're balanced for the next two and then slightly under in fiscal year 2027. But then you'll see beginning in fiscal year 28 and going out beyond that, we'll start having some big shortfalls. And so, so what's driving the shortfalls? Well, the first thing is Measure F expires in December of 2027. And Measure F is, again, a quarter cent sales tax that generates about $1.1 million annually for the city. Um, another thing that we have on the um, expense side is rising pension costs. So our cost that we pay to CalPERS for retirement system is really out of our control. It's kind of driven by them and the numbers that they give us. And I'll show you some graphs that make it extremely challenging to budget for. And then um, third is sales tax, which is our primary revenue source, about 45% of our general fund. It's not keeping pace with inflation. Uh, so first is uh, CalPERS. So CalPERS is, like I said, the retirement system, and it can be broken into two different pieces. One is the normal cost that we pay as we're ongoing for retirement benefits for the staff that's here right now. 
And then the other is what they call their unfunded actuarial liability, which is a shortfall for benefits for people that are currently in the system as well as retirees. So the causes, the main causes for that UAL is either this, the retroactively give benefits to employees, which the city did back in 2004, and then when CalPERS misses their investment target. So they invest all of their funds and they target that they'll get a, at the time it was 7%, they dropped that down to 6.8% return and then a fourth time. They've missed that target seven out of the last nine years. So you can see on this graph right here, we did issue, um, when we did the retroactive benefits, we did a pension obligation bond for 10 years, which paid off in 2017. So that was about 670,000 a year. So you can see on this chart that it grows from kind of where we started at that 670, and then it'll drop down there in 2017. But these last, since 2017, through what we know now, in 2025 is actual payments, and then PERS is forecasting the next five years. That's a $2.8 million difference from 2010 to 2020. Next slide. Oh, and then sales tax. So sales tax, it's um, our largest general fund revenue, 45%. You can see primarily that um, 41st Avenue is kind of the economic engine for sales tax, generating about 80% of it. And the problem that we have there is it's relatively flat. It's growing at about 2 to 2.5% two a year, which isn't super high. Um, so this is putting that on a graph. So using uh, 2006 as the base year, the city had, and this is just the 1% Bradley Burns tax, and I'll, I'll, we get into a little bit of what that is, but um, that's charged at every sale. District tax is a little bit different, which is what Measure F is, but looking at the 1%, um, sales tax. We had 5.5 million in 2006. This year, 2024, 23, we had 6.2 million. So it's increased slightly, but if you had run those same 5.5 million number, base it on inflation, that number should be 8.6. So we've created about, we have about a $2.3 million like loss of spending power just due to inflation. So I think I sort of, we sort of kicked it off with this, but basically the combined effect of those two things is, is we've lost probably $5 million in purchasing power for a city, and our general fund is a little bit under $20 million. So when you think about that in context, it's like we have 25% less money than we had in 2006, which has put a strain on the overall city's budget. I mean, you know, ever since I've been here, we are always looking for these efficiency improvements and ways to sort of trim costs and sort of try to manage within what we can do. And it's gotten harder and harder and harder, I'll be honest with you. And so what that's meant is when we've been able to put less general fund into our roads, less general fund into maintaining our facilities, less competitive practices for recruitment and retention of employees, it's just all of those things combining. Um, and they've really been kind of coming to a head, if you will, in these, in these coming years. Um, this is an analysis that I really like, but I really like analysis. So for those of you that don't, you can just tune me out for a second. But this is something Jim and I did a couple of years back. When we, you know, I hear this a lot as a city manager. We all pay so much in taxes. Like, we pay so much in taxes. Why isn't the city doing more with the money? Well, we went through and we did a little bit of an exercise and said, okay, how much taxes does Capitola pay? You know, if we were like our own island nation, how much taxes would the city really pay? We came up with a conservative estimate of about $180 million in tax revenue that the city of Capitol would pay. That's looking at like average income tax return, all total property tax, total sales tax. Of that $180 million, the city keeps about $13 million. So when people talk about paying a lot, sure they do. You know, there's no question about it, but it's predominantly <clears throat> going to the state of California and to Washington, D.C., and very little is actually kept here in Capitola. Um, Another example of that is, is our property taxes. You know, I know a lot of people in this room own places in Capitola and you pay a fair amount of property tax. And, you know, the property tax gets divvied up between different entities. The city of Capitola doesn't compete, com sorry, doesn't keep very much of that. Um, we actually only keep about 7.5% of the property tax. Central Fire gets about twice as much property tax as the city of Capitola does. And the county, believe it or not, Santa Cruz County keeps 
three times as much property tax as half of the residents pay as income tax uh, compared to the city. So it's a little hard to fathom. I'm not sure exactly what services the county is providing in the city of Capitola. I know they provide social services to, uh, to everyone in our, in our uh, county, but it's a little bit frustrating to see these kinds of charts. Um, so with that, it kind of brings us to this idea of a new tax measure. And you know, when we started looking at this, everyone realized that we've accomplished the goals of Measure F early um, and taken a look at potentially, basically, since Measure F's goals have been accomplished, repealing it and replacing it with a half cent tax measure. This would generate about $2.2 million a year and close that fiscal gap for a long term. Um, we did polling. Uh, the city did polling. We didn't poll this exact question. We actually polled a more simple question about just replacing Measure F. And overall, voters were definitely supportive and recognized the need of the city for more revenue to maintain services. Um, the top priorities, this is ranked by voters that came through in that survey, were public safety, police response, obviously, the roads, uh, including sidewalks and bike lanes, uh, maintaining the beach and our new wharf, uh, support for youth programming, and support for small businesses. So these were all kind of the things that really resonated with voters when we asked them about where they saw the need. So why a sales tax? Um, first one is obvious, the fiscal challenges we talked about. The second is the expiration of Measure F, which is going to be coming to an end in our uh, close in 2027. Um, the polling coupled with previous support for a tax measure or sales tax measures at Capitola have always been high. You know, we've polled, we've never tried since I've been here, but we've tried looking at other forms of tax changes and things like utility, users' taxes, things like that don't, don't tend to get the same level of support as a sales tax. And part of the reason for that could be that, you know, the, the sales tax burden is shared at Capitola. It's, it's, we don't have exact numbers about what percent of the sales tax the city gets uh, it's actually paid by residents. The only thing we, we can see is car sales. For car sales, we can see the exact division between how many um, Subarus and Hondas that are Toyotas <laughs> that are sold over there on Auto Plaza Drive or bought by Capitola residents. And it's actually significantly less than a third. But being conservative, looking at the overall numbers, I'm super comfortable saying that only about a third or less of the total tax is paid by residents. And so sales tax is a way to kind of strike a balance between residents paying some of their fair share for the services, as well as the visitors who have an impact on, you know, our services, on our streets, on our infrastructure. Um, another factor is, is, you know, when we look around, we obviously have to understand that we're in a competitive environment. And there's other jurisdictions. They have other tax rates. And Capitola at this point has the lowest tax rate uh, in the county. These are the rates that will be effective as of next week. Um, so we're at 9% is our sales tax rate in Capitola. The other cities are at 9 and 3 quarters percent, and the unincorporated county is at 9 and a half percent. Um, so just looking around, you can see that we are, you know, we are in a competitive environment in terms of our business environment, but we are at this point significantly lower than everybody else. So the idea behind the, the measure that will be proposed to council is, is New general general tax, which could be used for all basic purposes, with a focus on public safety, community policing, our beach, our roads, our parks. Um, focusing on the new wharf, there's going to be a long-term plan for the wharf where we're going to identify whether that new wharf has structures in the future or doesn't have structures. That's going to need money. Our experience is is that um, things on the wharf tend to be very competitive for regional, state, federal funding. Um, but we have to have a plan. And so funding from a local jurisdiction for these things is really important because when we have a plan, then we can go sell it to Congressman Panetta or our representatives in Sacramento. Uh, but trying to get that plan and that vision and sell that vision, that's really important, and it's incumbent on us to do that. And then the programming, the support for our youth programming, junior guards, obviously those things are just so kind of ingrained into the culture of capital. Turn it over to Chief Daly and talk a little bit about the future in the department. Thank you. 
sorry about that, uh, to become competitive uh, with other agencies as far as salaries and benefits and keep our, um, our staff uh, continue to want to work here and support our community. Uh, similar to what the city manager mentioned, we have a whole lot of parks and great facilities here in Capitola. We've been very fortunate to get outside funders and people support us. We continue to look for grants for these things. They are very attractive projects, both state and federal monies, but you have to have one, a plan, but then two, a match. And so a lot of times they will provide 75% and we will have that 25% from a local match funds. Um, also very important to voters. Um, are our streets. And so the city does have a pavement management plan in place that the council has approved. And with the funds that we have, we do use them strategically to maintain our roads the best to our ability. But really it comes down to how much funding we have to put into them. Uh, similarly with grants for road projects, um, it really helps us not only maintain the roads for vehicles, but also for pedestrians and bicyclists. And that's becoming extremely important, especially with the rise of uh, e-bikes in the community. And then lastly, as Jamie mentioned, uh, we're undergoing a study for what to do for our long-term uses of the wharf. Surely anything we're going to go do out there is going to need some kind of revenue to support it. So with that, what can you do to help? <laughs> uh, the first thing is a little bit back to what I kind of kicked off with is, is, you know, as members of our boards and commissions in Capitola, your leaders in our community, you know, people will look to you with questions about measure why is the city doing this we don't understand we tried to provide some information in this in these slides um, you know we can make them available we have copies in the back um, if anyone wants them they can just grab that the second is Mike Permany here in the front row um, I understand is going to be working to help from a grassroots level try to help get this passed so if you're interested in helping out Paradise Grill. Come on. <laughs> and then the last is obviously you can vote. So with that, I'm just trying to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, this is a joint meeting of all the boards and commissions of the city of Capitola. I don't think we have a quorum from any particular board here this evening, but we do. The Planning Commission. Okay. Well, in that case, then. This is an opportunity to ask any questions or provide any comment uh, at this planning commission meeting this evening. So if anybody has any questions or any comments, we'd love to hear them. We'll do our best to answer them. If, if we can't, we will always follow up. Any questions? Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, two questions I have. Um, one thing you said that um, it's estimated that Measure F brought in about six million dollars. Um, and what, was that based off an of estimate? Um, like, how does that look from what the projected was when Measure F originally passed? So, what has happened? Going back to the point Jim made about the sales tax not keeping up with inflation, when Measure F was originally passed, we were at about a million dollars a year, if I remember right, and. We've had a hard time growing that district tax. So it's been at about, I mean, that's that six million is like six years worth of measure F now. Um, so it has not grown as strongly as the 1%, which hasn't kept up with inflation. So I think measure F probably generated a little bit less, 7% less than we were hoping at this stage it would have been at. But the city brought in, help me here, three. $20 million from Congressman Panetta of the earmark, $3.5 million from Congressman Panetta, $1.9 million from Assemblyman Bill Stone. Um, you know, we've got a lot of other funders, and so we were really able to leverage those funds and, and cover the shortfall with outside funding. And then um, my next question, um, I heard a lot of um, community questions and stuff about like just about programs like junior guard programs and stuff, and with, you know, with this measure being asked by Capital residents directly to support it. Well, then obviously it would be a self tax measure, but it would be a lot of different community people in the, the Santa Cruz County paying for it. But would there be some way of revisioning maybe some of those services being earmarked to go to capital residents first, like just using junior guards? And I'm not trying to get in the weeds on it, but would that be something that would be looked at a little bit different for upcoming future? 
that's certainly something we can't do. It hasn't been a level of granular level, hasn't been something we've talked about. But, you know, in terms of trying to grow programs that are focused on the city, that's obviously a core mission for us. And then just one last thing. I mean, I've been involved, involved in a lot of bond measure campaigns, like in school districts. They've had, like, a bond oversight, where there was a bond mission, like a city of oversight. Is that something the city looking at in the future, like, um, as an advisory group, you know, to help you know, with this, if there is new, if this passes, which I hope it does, and I support, um, but that would be something that maybe the city might look at some more like the city, um, from a community involvement standpoint in that kind of process. So my familiarity with the oversight committees is usually those are for restricted tax measures and or like a bond. So bond measures are taxes that are on on your property and are paid and paying for some specific city things. And so very often when you pass a bond measure, citizens, as, as Jerry mentioned, you know, cities will form an oversight committee to ensure that the funds are spent. You know, if you're going to build a police station as a bond, you're spending the money on the police station. With this, with a, as a general tax, um, I don't know if that, I haven't seen that structure personally. I do think that there's a role for the Finance Advisory Committee. And maybe that's, maybe that's the best answer is that Finance Advisory Committee can be presented with sort of annual audits, if you will, and then they can form their own oversight committee. Yeah, I thought it was just a good way of like gaining more community support. So you're right, from the bond measure standpoint, it was definitely allocated what you know, the projects were identified. And it was more of a two-thirds measure, but with just the oversight, and that might be the best way to handle it, the you know, facility, I mean, the finance committee. But I think it's just a way for the community to have another way of having input into the tax measure. Yeah, I, I like that idea, actually, specifically calling out the role of the Finance Advisory Committee and Board Oversight and helping advise community tax groups. Okay. And thanks for your presentation, so I'm all in support of what I heard tonight, so thank you. Wilk, um, I'm curious about um, sales tax, which is most of our revenue, as you pointed out. And so, has there been any projections or any progress on uh, Capitola Mall and Lerone Dyer? I mean, have they been figured in any of this or other development along 41st Street factored in? So, the Capitola Mall project has a very long history, as everyone here in this room, I think, knows. <laughs> Um, it was close. It was certainly close right before the pandemic. You know, you will recall that they came in with that conceptual review. They got pretty unanimous feedback from the Planning Commission and the City Council that they were going the right direction. They just threw some tweaks. Unfortunately, the pandemic, I think, really yanked the stool out from under them. They, uh, as a firm, Merlon Geyer significantly pulled back. Um, they terminated their project manager, who was the ideal person for the project. And frankly, the project has not moved in a while. Um, during our housing element, for those of you that haven't been tuned into the nuances of local government, we had to come up with a sites for a whole bunch of housing units, this current housing element site as required by the state of California. And we identified the mall site as a site for a whole bunch of those housing units. Merlon Geyer, the owner of the mall, pushed back uh, kind of at the last minute, kind of pulled the rug out from under us a little bit um, on our housing element, and basically said that they didn't think that they build that many units without some other changes in zoning. So our planning commission went back and took a look at that and ultimately recommended and the city council approved that the changes in zoning make the mall more economically feasible for development. My understanding is they've started work on something. What that something is, I don't know yet. So I do believe that there is some new movement within Merlon Geyer on mall redevelopment projects. I don't know what that looks like yet. Uh, these projections don't include mall redevelopment. Um, so that would be outside of these projections. We used to try to do that. I think we had some projections, Jim, remind me, where we were showing like tax revenues going down for like two or three years while mall was redeveloping and then coming back up. We got enthusiastic. <laughs> but I think uh, the pandemic kind of squashed that enthusiasm on my part. Not enthusiasm for the project, but um, optimism, shall we say. So we're basically saying that 41st Avenue, according to these projections, are, is going to be a, about the same in terms of revenue generation. Yeah, it's a, I think our long-term projections, it's a 2.5% growth factor for sales tax. I think okay. that's kind of what it's been over the last year. Yeah. Any 
any other questions or comments? Pat, the great question. For those of you that couldn't hear or those of you tuning in online, the question was, is it a quarter cent or a half cent? So the proposal is to repeal the quarter cent and replace it with a half cent. Uh, Keith Gale, a resident for about 35 years. Um, and first of all, I totally support everything you guys are trying to do and, and appreciate it. Um, I have just a couple uh, questions. One is, I've been here for 35 years, been to numerous city council meetings, and I know there was an effort about 20 years ago, and then it kind of got pushed aside and it's never been pushed. I don't quite understand why the city hasn't made some effort to try and pull additional businesses into Capitola. Because especially with the, the COVID and the pandemic, and with companies going hybrid, you're not necessarily looking at a bunch of extra employees and traffic and stuff moving into the city. You're simply looking at, and as I, those of you that are in, you know, semi-tech industry know, you know, like Santa Cruz Tech, you know, they have a monthly meeting and stuff, and there's Watsonville has got two or three brand new tech uh, uh, industries down there, and uh, you know, the, the one airplane company down there has got millions of dollars in, in grant money and stuff like that, and they're doing well and stuff like that. So. So my first thing would be, is there something we can do to try and look at attracting businesses to, to Capitola to obviously we generate the revenue from that company coming in? Okay, that's, that's my first one. Okay. I'm gonna give you the second one if you wanna talk about it. We can talk a little bit. Okay. Be informal. So, so first off, um, it kind of goes back to the question about the discussion about taxes and where taxes go. So. Cities don't get any income tax. We don't get any tax from businesses. We get sales tax, we get property tax, and we get hotel tax. Those are basically the taxes, basically the taxes we get. We do get some cannabis tax, but that'll support your local business. Um, so, so in terms of, so when we lose, when we lose like a, a business goes out, someone that's paying the 1%, replacing them with like offices is, I know the functional equivalent with replacing something with self-storage. Like it doesn't, it doesn't do anything for us. And even though it might be good high paying jobs, it doesn't do anything to help the city of Capitola's bottom line. So we do, you know, we do work really closely with our property owners to talk about kind of what are the options when spaces become available. New Leaf, I don't know for those of you that don't know, is gonna move into the um, Kings Plaza here shortly. My understanding is we're gonna get the Beverly Hills New Leaf. <laughs> which apparently is very fancy. So that's supposed that's going to be a real positive and help our bottom line. And then the old new leaf is going to be a grocery outlet, which apparently I have never been in one before, but apparently they do quite well as well. So those are some of kind of the, you know, got shocks was empty and the Coles building were empty in the great recession. And we worked with the owner of the mall and the owner of those buildings to help bring in Coles and target. So those are the kinds of like economic development things we do, but it's, it's hard for a little city to have this sort of these robust kind of like sending people to ICSC, it's well, yeah. these kind of big conventions to try to recruit folks. And I'll be honest with you, the landscape has changed so much with the pandemic. There are very few retailers at this point that are looking for these large format spaces. And you can see how long it's been since the outdoor world events has been going on. So there's a lot of changes kind of going on yeah, just an FYI, I've been in the physical security industry for the last 30 years. So, I, like, you're talking about the California housing and, and stuff like that. That is a $163,000 job that's going into Mountain View that, that we're not going to get. So, so I, I know I'm acutely aware of the real estate aspect of what's going on. My second point is, in terms of expenditures, um, is the fact that I know that we're looking at putting some money into Jade Street and the facilities there and spending that and stuff like that. Um, I have two questions. One is... Um, and looking at your slides, the, the, based on property taxes, the school district's getting six times the amount of money that the city is. So why are we giving them money, number one? And number two, based upon a past issue that we had with the city um, the, and the school district, I'm, I'm wondering, how is the school district able to spend money on property they do not own? Because, because the reason why the, the New Brighton gym was built, before it could be, get built, the school district had to give that property to the city so they could build on it. And since then, it's been transferred back. But my question is, how is the city looking at giving money, effectively giving money to the school district on Jade Street when they don't own that property? Okay. So Jade Street Community Center is located on school district property at, 
at Jade Street Park. And the city originally entered, I think it was a 50-year lease with the school district back in the 80s, 82? 82. And that was a 50-year lease then with the school district for the city to basically operate the space as a park and build a community center there. And we did. Uh, and we've had a community center there ever since. And community center... Um, we were getting towards the end of the lease. I think we were in the last 10 years of it. And the community center, for those of you who haven't been in it recently, it's getting pretty long in the tooth. Uh, the facility is run down. And so we went to the school district as a city and said, hey, we'd like to invest in this building here, but as any tenant would in any commercial enterprise, before you go investing in you know, your landlord roof, right, or a new kitchen, you want to extend your lease. So we did that. We negotiated a 20-year 20 or 30 year extension with the city years ago. So the city has secured a long term interest in the community center. Uh, and as part of that lease, we actually agreed to, they wanted us to agree to make improvements to the building to sort of fix the basic infrastructure, the HVAC, the roof, things like that. So the community center project is actually a really exciting one. The city has put some general fund in, but we've also obtained a million dollars from Assembly Member Don Addis, who was. Uh, willing to put some state funding into that facility to help pay for it. And we have an earmark request in with Congressman Panetta for $2.5 million to actually help build out this park and the roadway. So really kind of an exciting time uh, over there that there's potentially a whole bunch of, um, again, this notion of leveraging our local funds to stay in general funding to really kind of enhance that space. And then lastly, I'll just close on with the, 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 the gym. The city did build the gym uh, back for the school district, I think that was in the 80s, and we did return it to them, I think, about five or six years ago. Uh, New Brighton is New Brighton High School gym, which is probably as it should be. We were paying the utility bill for it for a long time. Okay. Any other questions? Thanks, guys, for all taking a little bit of time out of your Thursday night. I don't want to keep you too long. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to reach out to me. If you want to talk to Mike about helping out, feel free to. All right. Thank you all.